Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Planning Commission meeting for the 22nd of June, 2009. <clears throat> At this time, I'll call the meeting to order and ask if there's any public comment on any items not listed on the agenda this evening. Any community comments? Okay, seeing none, we'll move forward. There are no adoption, there are no Planning Commission meetings, <laughs> excuse me, there are no Planning Commission meeting minutes uh, this evening, so we'll move on to our first hearing, which is a continuation of CP09-01, which is Concept Master Plan for Oregon City Public Works Center Plan. Uh, at this time, I'm going to read our legal information, <clears throat> so bear with me. A staff report has been prepared for the application and has been made available seven days prior to this evening's hearing. The staff report identifies the approval criteria that apply to the applicant's proposal. If anyone would like me to read those criteria, please let me know. Staff has analyzed the criteria which are contained in the staff report along with any written comments and input that has been received through the public notification process for the application. The quasi-judicial hearing procedure the Commission will follow is set out in the state law and the Oregon City Municipal Code. The hearing procedure steps are shown on the chart to my left. Anyone wishing to speak should fill out a slip and give it to the planning staff before you speak. <clears throat> All letters, reports, or pictures must be marked as an exhibit by the planning staff before they can be submitted into the record. For the public record, please begin all testimony by stating your name and city of residence. Testimony and evidence should be directed toward the applicable approval criteria. If you believe other criteria apply, in addition to those addressed in the staff report, please identify and discuss those criteria and explain why you believe they apply to the application under consideration. A person does not have to testify in order to submit written materials of any length while the public record is open on each application. However, any party wishing for a continuance or to keep the record open must make that request before the public hearing is closed. If the Planning Commission makes a decision with which you disagree, any issue which you may wish to appeal must have been raised for the Commission's consideration. Without raising the issue on the record with sufficient specificity and accompanied by statements or evidence so that the City and all parties can respond, this issue will not be adjudged appealable to the State Land Use Board of Appeals. In addition, Oregon Revised Statutes 197-796 requires us to announce the following. The failure of an applicant to raise constitutional or other issues relating to proposed conditions of approval uh, <clears throat> excuse me, with sufficient specificity to allow the local government or its designee to respond to the issue precludes an action for damage in circuit court. At this time, uh, I'll ask if any commissioners have any additional ex parte contacts to talk about, conflict of interest or bias, or any other statement to declare. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'll just say that um, I did go... Um, uh, on a uh, Tuesday morning after we last met and uh, um, parked on uh, South uh, uh, John Adams Street and watched traffic for 15 minutes, counted six vehicles. And so it was easy for me to calculate uh, 24 vehicles an hour, easy to come up with 200 in an eight-hour period. So um, I did look at that a little bit more. Okay. Uh, yeah, one of the criteria for sitting on uh, the Planning Commission, and I've said this before, and in uh, previous uh, in, in previous uh, public hearings with this application is 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 one of uh, one of the things is that I can't be biased and uh, I need to talk about that a little bit and see if there's any questions or comments um, I have a unique perspective on this application um, not only my plan I'm a planning commissioner but I live within 300 feet of the site uh, I, I live on John Adams and so I know this site pretty intimately um, as much as anybody in this room and a lot of people recognize me from the walks that I take with my dogs so I know this this site pretty pretty intimately um, but my role tonight is here I'm, I'm here as a planning commissioner tonight I have to look at the evidence here as a planning commissioner so um, that's how my decision will be made tonight not as a private citizen if I wanted to do that I'd be on that side of the table but tonight I'm a planning commissioner. So I just want everybody to know the ground at which I'm operating. So I, I don't feel that I am biased one way or the other on this application. It's the evidence in front of me. So if anybody has any questions, comments, or challenges, I'd be happy to hear them. Okay, anyone else? Any additional? Obviously I have visited the site many times growing up there but have no bias or concern over the specific application. Okay. Any 
questions of the, the commission on any of these statements? Okay, seeing none, then uh, this evening the procedures for tonight will begin with a staff report. And uh, Tony, you'll give us uh, any updates? Correct. Since our last meeting, thank you. Okay, so I'll go ahead and begin with, um, I'm going to enter some exhibits into the record. Uh, you received a memorandum from from me dated June 16, 2009 and included four exhibits, um, a memorandum from Mr. Lewis, operations manager at Public Works, a memorandum from uh, Mr. Coffey from DKS and Associates dated June 12, 2009, a memorandum from Mr. Miner of Michael Miner Associates dated June 15, 2009, and a memorandum from D. Griffin, uh, the State Historical Preservation Office dated June 9, 2009. We'll enter those into the record as Exhibit A. Uh, I believe we did deliver those to you uh, via email uh, last week, as well as the McLaughlin Neighborhood Association and the CIC. Uh, the second I exhibit I'd like to enter into the record is a uh, letter, um, two-page letter with uh, two pages of pictures uh, from Mr. Herman. Um, and we'll go ahead and uh, call that Exhibit B. It's dated June 22, 2009. Um, I received several additional exhibits to be entered into the record as folks present testimony. When they come up to testify, I'll enter them into the record at that point. Um, I'd also like to clarify on Exhibit A, which we did not reproduce for you and send. Um, originally, we had an air quality analysis submitted. It's dated May 27, 2009. Uh, prepared by Mr. Bloom for, for, for Mr. Hyman. It was entered into the record. Um, there was a typo on page three, so they submitted an amended page three. Um, the air quality standards, it's, it had a table that referenced federal standards and Washington state standards, and they just changed that to recommend to state standard in that table. Um, and then also on a June 15, 2009 memorandum from Michael minor to David Hyman concerning the noise analysis. There was also a, an additional typo on page seven of that exhibit that you received, um, and it referenced a sound level. Um, instead of being in the 60, degree, 60 decibel level range, it referenced, I, I believe, 692 off the top of my head or something like that. So it's just those two corrections, and we'll enter those into the record, but you did not receive those as part of your packet. So tonight I'll be presenting the st uh, staff report with the recommended conditions of approval for concept plan 0901. This is for the Public Works Operations Center master plan for the property located at 122 Center Street with additional properties on the west side of the street where two existing parking lots are located as well as the sites above the bluff uh, with access via South Center Street and South John Adams. Uh, this, also, this application also includes um, property not currently owned by the city, which is the armory site, which is up on what we'll call the upper site. Uh, the applicant is in uh, negotiations with uh, the owner of that property, being the Oregon Military Department, uh, for potential purchase of that, of that piece. Um, I am going to, as I walk through, I'm going to give you a brief background. I'm not going to go into all the detail. You've seen this application several times. Um, if you do have questions anytime, please do stop and ask me. Um, I'm really going to try and get to the approval criteria and work through those rather than going over the application in great detail. You've, you've seen it several times, and it is outlined in your staff report. Uh, the subject site is uh, zoned institutional. Directly south of the site is Waterboard Park owned by the city. It is also zoned institutional. Um, in order to encroach into Waterboard Park, we would need a charter amendment. So that property line is set along that south property line unless we go to a vote of the people to move that property line. Uh, the properties uh, to the north and east are zoned uh, R6. The properties to the north and west are zoned R3.5 residential. Uh, meaning uh, the R6, 6,000-square-foot uh, 6, minimum lot size, and the R3.5 is a 3,500-square-foot minimum lot size. Uh, the property is within the McLaughlin Conservation District, uh, which means any new development, um, any new structures on the site would need to go in front of the historic Oregon City Historic Review Board for approval. 
um, and we'll address that uh, as we go through the staff report because there were adjustments requested for some of the buildings up on the upper site concerning uh, historic review board review. The applicant has proposed four phases of development over 10 years. There are currently 33 full-time employees on the site with a potential full build out of 70 full-time employees and a total of approximately 50, uh, 54,380 square feet of office and warehouse to be located on the site after demolition and construction of new buildings. Um, Part of phase one, is some of the major parts of phase one include the closure of South John Adams through the upper site. Uh, that John Adams was vacated um, quite a while ago. Um, so it's actually a private street across that property right now. Uh, so the applicant has proposed to close that as part of phase one. Um, uh, phase one also includes uh, security fencing around the site, demolition of the upper site warehouses, site grading, paving, and landscaping. Phase two includes the construction of approximately 25,600 square foot office building on the lower site, uh, adjacent to uh, Center Street on the east side of the road. Um, they would also include South Center Street uh, improvements, what we would consider half street improvements, uh, which includes the drive lane, bike lane, um, which we may defer to later concerning the striping of that just because of there doesn't currently exist a striping system out there. Um, street trees, sidewalks, etc. cetera, uh, standards uh, half street improvements as well as additional landscaping of the site. Phase three uh, includes the construction of the fleet storage and shop buildings, covered walkways and patios, additional street improvements to South Center Street and uh, South John Adams. And then phase four, if the acquisition of the armory hasn't occurred, they'd still be looking into acquiring the armory at, as part of that phase. Um, South Center Street improvements, improvements to uh, the street the street parking lots that are located on the west side of South Center Street, the two existing parking lots that are there, um, if they're still owned by the city, as well as additional landscaping and stormwater improvements. We move into the concept development plan, and it has approval criteria which we utilize to review the application. And the first one, and I'm just going to go ahead and read this to you so we all recommend or realize what we are reviewing this against and that is the proposed concept development plan is consistent with the purpose of section 1765 which is to foster the growth of major institutions and other large-scale development while identifying and mitigating the impacts of such development on surrounding properties and public infrastructure the city recognizes the valuable services and employment opportunities that these developments bring to Oregon City residents the master plan process is intended to facilitate an efficient and flexible review process for major developments and to provide them with the assurance they need over the long term so that they can plan for and execute their developments in a phased manner. To facilitate this, the master plan process is structured to allow an applicant to address the larger development issues, such as adequacy of infrastructure and transportation capacity, and reserve capacity of the infrastructure and transportation system before expenditure of final design costs. So it's a pretty broad approval criteria there. It doesn't exactly tell you, other than infrastructure, you know, what else can be included in that. So I've also included in there uh, reviews of the air quality. The uh, applicant had an air quality consultant come out and look at the site. And their major finding was that through improved technology and regulations at both the state and federal level, and that the truck parking is not located directly adjacent to residential properties, but is rather located in the center of the site, they found they have no adverse impact on air quality or odor around the site. The applicant also went out and consulted with a noise consultant to look at the site. Currently, the Oregon City Municipal Code does not have a noise ordinance that identifies a decibel level at the property line. It's, it's more of a nuisance ordinance, which, um, you know, it's something happening at night. You try and document it and, and deal with it that way. There's no decibel level. You go to the property line and say it, it's supposed to be, you know, 40 and it's 50. Um, so that makes it a little difficult. So what the consultant did is they write on the um, Oregon Administrative Rules um, uh, work um, the, the requirements from DEQ. And what they found was that at one location along South John Adams, it exceeded the recommendations from DEQ by one decibel level. The, <coughs> the consultant recommended several best management practices to be utilized on the site. And um, staff recommended that these be implemented to the maximum extent uh, reasonable. Um, 
two of the recommendations that we had concern with just in terms of how do you implement them so it's hard to make them a hard and fast requirement because there's so much discretion on 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 when they when when such an occurrence would occur or when it wouldn't and one of them had to do with notifying all the neighbors when an extremely noisy event is going to occur and uh, as the noise consultant uh, testified last time it's it's very very difficult to to say what's noisy to mr. Commissioner Lejoie versus what's noisy to me uh, that's that's one difficult part and the other one is that how far out do you go you know so I guess you know we were concerned with that that we include these as best management practices and if they know they're going to be up there doing something ahead of time that they try and notify the neighbors um, but it's hard to say what's loud you know um, so that we had a little concern there you know if it's something that they're going to be doing outside where they know they're going to be doing some major construction or deconstruction of something it may be reasonable to go and notify uh, if you've got a broken down truck that you've got to deal with in the yard um, and you've got to use a pneumatic gun to get the tire off is that something where we need to delay a day to go notify neighbors that at you know four o'clock tomorrow tomorrow afternoon we're going to be going and doing that so that that was our concern and that's why we made that recommendation that it be to the maximum extent reasonable <coughs> I also included in the staff reports exhibits uh, from the uh, City Commission when they adopted the operation facilities plan um, there's a lot of questions about is this site appropriate and staff, uh, the Public Works Department staff, has been working under the direction of the City Commission, which adopted that operations facilities plan, which recommended and, and directed them to utilize this site. So while I understand the concerns raised by the citizens about the appropriateness of the site, we need to consider the appropriateness in relation to the approval criteria of the code of the master plan. Um, it, it's it's difficult to go back you know, we have direction from the City Commission on how to proceed and staff being the Public Works Department prepared an application for the site building on that operation facility plan that was approved by the City Commission uh, so some of these questions of analyzing and reviewing other sites throughout the city I in staff's opinion and Planning Commission can can do with it what they will I think it exceeds the approval criteria of the concept master plan um, we also include I also included a, a condition concerning fencing we received comments from the Historic Review Board uh, the applicant did take this in front of the Historic Review Board uh, to receive uh, input from them and they did submit a letter into the record which you've been able to review and one of the concern was about fencing and where it's located uh, staff also has a concern about the use of barbed wire fence for security we realize that there are areas of the site that just do not have visibility it's dark uh, where barbed wire may be appropriate uh, so we have conditioned them as part of their detailed development plan to submit the fencing plan for the site with type where barbed wire would be located and what measures can be implemented to mitigate those uh, as far as aesthetics and view corridors from surrounding residential properties in the park the second approval criteria deals with the transportation system and it deals with the uh, demonstrating the transportation system has sufficient capacity based on the city's level of service and is capable of safely supporting the development proposed in addition to the existing and planned uses in the area will be made adequate by the time each phase of development is completed uh, we had our uh, transportation um, consultant review the the applicant the transportation impact analysis prepared by the applicant um, all of the level of service standards for the surrounding intersections are met at full build out with the proposed development included and that when they reviewed the transportation uh, counts and the trip generation there were no warrants met for stoplights or the additions of uh, left turn lane pockets on any of the streets the applicant did recommend and the and our traffic consultant did concur that we should implement traffic management strategies that include and I'm just going to paraphrase um, that tr trucks larger than one ton um, only be allowed to proceed north on South John Adams except during emergency situations that there be a 20 mile an hour uh, mile per hour limit on city vehicles <coughs> on South John Adams between 1st and 5th Street and that the South John Adams gate be closed at 430 on weekdays 430 p.m. 
on weekdays and that it is closed um, all weekend, so from 4.30 p.m. on Friday till the opening on Monday morning, um, utilizing the South Center Street as the primary access to the site during those times. And that coincides with the work week for Public Works, which is 7 to 4.30, and then on Fridays they actually have half their staff because they work a flex schedule there. Uh, the recommended improvements that we also concurred with are is uh, making South Center Street a through street with only a stop sign on First Street rather than a three-way stop. Um, street improvements to South Center and South John Adams, which have been appro approved or uh, uh, proposed by the applicant, and verifying the site distance where the private drive comes into South Center Street um, as part of the DT D detailed development plan when it is submitted, if not sooner. We've also recommended some conditions of approval, 17 and 18, um, which deal with as you're coming into the upper site from South Center Street, there's a sharp right-hand turn around right at the corner of roughly 306 South Center Street, the uh, residence there. And one uh, option would be to put a mirror at that corner to help with some of the site visibility around that corner because of the narrowness of the driveway um, accessing that site. Um, other methods could also be utilized, though we would leave that to the transportation engineer to review and come up with a recommendation for that. And then as well as to try and expand the asphalt on South Center Street, um, it functions, it works, a uh, little extra space would, would be, um, would help. Um, if we do have trucks going in both directions up and down that, uh, that uh, driveway up to the upper site. There was the pedestrian access. So currently the Parks and Rec Master Trails Master Plan shows bike and ped going through the upper site along the South John Adams um, vacated right of way. And the applicant is proposing to close and gate off that access through that upper site area, thereby limiting the ability for for bike and ped to get through the site from South John Adams down to South Center Street. Um, there were comments concerned about creating a trailhead at the uh, south end of South John Adams Street. Uh, trailhead is not identified in the trails master plan um, and the applicant has also indicated that the parking down on South Center Street could be utilized for um, public parking to be able to access Waterboard Park, and we think South Center Street is a much more appropriate place to try and park people rather than right at the entrance to South Waterboard Park there, or South to Waterboard Park right there at the end of South John Adams. Uh, there's limited visibility. Uh, I'm not sure you really want to be drawing um, citizens who may not be familiar with the area trying to get them up into South John Adams there to park um, and provide more areas for parking is really appropriate. So, but really we went back to the master plan for the trails master plan, which didn't identify the need for a trail parking head right there. That's really more of a community local access rather than a regional draw parking area uh, to access it. We have recommended that the applicant provide additional signage to get folks down to the additional parking on South Center Street, as well as to move the construction of the access um, from the private drive along that, en that enters the upper site along South Center Street to Waterboard Park. They're going to build a new uh, trail connection. We recommended that be moved up to Phase 1 since the closure of that path would occur in Phase 1, thereby allowing you to go down South John Adams Street up into Waterboard Park, down the new um, trail to the private street that would then take you down to South Center Street, maintaining that connection between South Center Street and South John Adams Street. The third approval criteria for the master plans deals with public services for water, fire, sanitary, waste, uh, storm water. Uh, we attached, um, th there's plenty of capacity to serve the site. Um, we did attach conditions concerning looping. Um, the, the water line between South John Adams and Center Street just means providing a connection. It helps with water quality, reduces dead ends, uh, dead end lines and whatnot, so you have better water quality. And then also providing a fire hydrant. Um, there were conditions concerning attaching to the nearest public or private line for sanitary, um, more administrative than um, there, there is adequate capacity to serve the, the development. The fourth condition, the proposed concept development protect plan protects any inventoried Goal 5 natural, historic, or cultural resources within the pros development boundary consistent with the provisions of applicable overlay districts. Okay. 
Uh, I think it's important to note that while there are trees and um, buildings up there that are that are older, um, there are no Go Five natural resources, cultural resources, or historic resources identified on the site. Uh, the applicant has worked with the Historic Review Board, and we've and we've implemented through conditions the recommendations from the Historic Review Board as far as additional measures the city is going to take to document and try and find alternative methods to demolition of the existing warehouses on the upper site. But they are not designated structures, um, so they are not a protected Goal 5 resource. The applicant... Oh. Uh, the fifth criteria is the pros concept development plan, including development standards and impact mitigation thresholds and improvements adequately mitigates identified impacts from each phase of development. Uh, for needed housing, the development standards and mitigation shall be clear and objective. There's no needed housing um, as uh, part of this application. Um, we believe that the applicant has proposed an application with mitigation me measures or we've implemented and recommended conditions of approval that adequately mitigate uh, the impacts from this uh, concept development plan. As part of the concept development plan, the applicant can request adjustments to city standards. And these um, adjustments become the standards that we use to review the application when it comes in. And the applicants uh, requested five, five adjustments uh, to the existing uh, municipal code. The first adjustment deals with, um, in the institutional zone, the maximum building height. And it states within 100 feet of any district boundary, the height is not to exceed 35 feet. Elsewhere, it's not to exceed 70 feet. And the applicant has requested that the adjustment um, state that for the office building located on the lower site, it shall not exceed 60 feet. So they're asking for an increase from 35 to 60 feet on that lower site for where it's located within 100 feet of the of the uh, district boundary. Um, I did provide in the staff report uh, two drawings, uh, exhibits 18 and 19, where we tried to show uh, with the zoning map. The zoning map shows where the boundary, the district boundary is, and the district boundary is in the middle of the right-of-way. Uh, so we have a zoning map, and we tried, and we took, and I took 100 foot off of that approximately to show where that 100 foot line is in relation to the existing site. Then we also attached a uh, um, a site photo, an overhead with the exact same measurement on it. And what we were trying to demonstrate was that, you know, w if you with the inclusion of the right of way, you start to to get that buffer in between where the proposed building, office building, would be and the existing residential across the street. I also provided calculations of how far uh, those buildings are from the front, um, th where the front of the building would be located. Uh, the applicant has indicated that uh, the front of the building will not exceed the 35-foot height limit as required by the institutional zone. They would step back those those higher elevation, uh, those um, those those late the, the third and fourth floor. They would step those back. Uh, to try and meet the intent of not having that large mass building right up at the Center Street uh, right-of-way, and then also to step it back to reduce the massing of the building. Uh, I think it's uh, in, in my uh, review, I also noted, noted that you run into a little conflict here where you've got 1762055, our site plan design review, which deals with commercial and institutional buildings, which says the building can be no more than five feet from the right-of-way line. So we want these buildings pulled up, but then we also want to limit the height. So I believe the applicant is trying to accomplish that. They're trying to provide a pedestrian scale building along South Center Street as our commercial and institutional design standards would like with you know, our, our articulation of the front, our uh, uh, transparency of the windows, our public access between the front of the building and the, and the street right of way and the sidewalk, no parking in front of the building. But then they're also trying to accommodate um, a limited site with a 40-foot bluff in it and how to not only get access to that upper site but also maintain visual oversight of that upper site from offices within the building for security and supervision purposes. So I believe that the applicant has proposed through this adjustment to try and, try and meet the intent of several different code criteria. And I, and I believe they've done that. I think it's also important to note that the actual building, when it comes in in phase two, will have to go in front of 
not only staff through a type 2 decision which has public comment on the design of it and it will need to meet our design standards uh, for institutional buildings. It will also need to go in front of the Historic Review Board for approval of the historical com compatibility of the building with the McLaughlin Conservation District. So while we are uh, uh, approving this adjustment, there's still additional review that needs to occur before any building would be built on the site. Um, so I believe that the adjustment is, is warranted based on the limitations of the site and, and the requirements of the code for what type of a building we're looking for with public uh, access to that building and bringing it up to the front of the street, as well as trying to accommodate the security that's needed for the site, access to the upper site, and, and be just being able to, to, to be able to see that upper yard. <coughs> the second um, adjustment deals with setbacks. Um, 25 feet from the property line, except when the development is adjacent to a public right-of-way. When adjacent to a public right-of-way, the minimum setback is 50 and the maximum setback is 5. The applicant has proposed to allow a zero setback at property lines between Waterboard Park and the subject site, so along that south property line. The armory building in the subject, subject site, so kind of on the southeast part of the, of the site. And then on the north side, along South First, First Street and Washington Street in the subject site. Um, we, staff didn't find any concerns with the adjustments for the first two, for Waterboard Park and the armory building. Uh, there's quite a the applicant's not actually going all the way to zero along this along Waterboard Park. Um, it'll start, uh, you know, between three and four feet, and then gradually get bigger as you move east along the site. Um, it's also, I think, important to note that Waterboard, the actual trail in Waterboard Park, extends quite uh, up high up into the park uh, at that location. There's at least 25 feet in between the property line and the trail in there, and there is some. Uh, some grade differential between where the upper site is and the trails located in Waterboard Park, and it's very densely vegetated. Um, what I'm trying to point out is that there's, it's, it's not as if adjacent to the upper site, it's a flat area where folks are recreating in terms of picnicking or playing ball. It's, it's a highly vegetated area where um, if you're down in there, you're, 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 you're chasing something rather than walking down there for recreation. So we feel that there's an appropriate buffer along that south side. <laughs> Um, to accommodate the intent of the zone. Um, the second one deals with the armory building. The armory building has not only a parking lot, but additional landscaping um, in between their site and where the new uh, um, buildings would be located on the upper site. Um, so with that increased buffer, once again, um, we believe they're meeting the intent of the, of, of the zone. And... Um, they're meeting the intent of the zone and, uh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought for a second. Um, and the city is looking into purchasing the armory site. Um, we did initially own that property, um, and there is a buyback uh, clause in our agreement with them to buy it back for a, for a minimal nominal fee. Um, the third one deals with the zero foot back at South First Street and Washington Street. Uh, the applicant has requested the zero foot setback at that location. And that includes, as part of that proposal, of vacating part of those the public right-of-ways. The right-of-ways will not be built uh, because of the change in topography at that location. What staff found was that um, if the, if the right-of-way is vacated, half would go back to the city, half would go to the adjacent neighbors to the north. Um, so we had some concern. And the proposed uses along that north property line are um, storage facility to park park trucks in as well as to put some rock and whatnot for storage. Um, so we recommended that we implement the R6 setback along that property line if the property is vacated. So that would pull them back off of that ridge line, um, allow for some landscaping and whatnot to be put along that ridge line to, to lessen the uh, aesthetic impact for the properties below looking up at that site. It'll get those garages pulled away. If the property, if the right of way is not vacated, you'll still have that that 50 plus right of way in between the properties to the north and the subject site. Uh, uh, so if the property is not, re not vacated, we, set, we, we recommended that we go ahead and allow the zero foot setback um, at that location. The third adjustment has to deal with the off street 
parking standards. We require a 24 foot backing distance. The applicant has requested a 20 foot backing distance to in order to provide additional landscaping, exterior landscaping and interior landscaping on the two existing parking lots on the uh, west side of South Center Street on the, on the lower site. Um, really the, the 24 foot backing distance is really more dealing with allowing two cars to be able to get past one another in a large parking lot uh, that for the two drive aisles. Um, because of the slow speed, the one-way nature of these parking lots, we really don't see any problems with reducing it four feet to the 20-foot backing distance. Uh, the fourth uh, adjustment deals with uh, what I was referring to before is our site plan design review, which is in 1762. We have <coughs> multiple sections, but 050 is our general design standards that we use for our industrial um, uh, employment type of a building, whereas 055 we use more uh, for our institutional and commercial buildings that you'd see along 7th or Beaver Creek or Malala. Uh, the applicant has requested that the um, the, con the construction of the buildings, uh, uh, the construction on the upper site shall be exempt from the from the 1762-055 institutional and commercial building standards. Just because of the nature of the use of those buildings um, being mostly for storage of trucks and, and work areas uh, rather than a, a, a public access. You're not going to have public access into that area. You're not going to have public streets. You're not going to have public uh, sidewalks going along the front of those where you need to, need to deal with that, that public uh, private property building uh, interaction in terms of uh, providing public access to it, improving the street uh, aesthetics and whatnot. So we've recommended that that adjustment be granted, as well as the fifth adjustment. Um, all structures located within the McLaughlin Historic uh, Conservation District need to go through 1740, our historic overlay district, and the applicant has requested that um, the, once again, the buildings on the upper site be exempt from the Historic Review Board uh, review. Um, the buildings on the lower site, the parking lot, whatnot, would still go in front of the Historic Review Board. We're just talking the buildings on the upper site. Um, and we do have, as part of the letter from the uh, Historic Review Board, indicating that they, uh, that they do support that uh, adjustment as requested by the applicant. Um, with that, I think I'll go ahead and, and wrap up my staff report. We did, uh, we recommended 18 conditions of approval. We've walked through some of them tonight. Um, be happy to answer any questions you may have or uh, clarify the conditions of approval that we've recommended. Okay, thank you, Tony. Are there any questions of staff at this time? From anyone? No? Yeah, I do. Yeah, go ahead, Dan. I do. Uh, uh, Question, Tony, about you, you referred to a detailed development plan. Does the Planning Commission see that document and approve that document? No. So the detailed development plan implements each of the phases that have been identified in the concept plan, mm -hmm. and we have thresholds set up. So as long as you're within, um, say, say 10 percent of the building size, you get to go in front of staff because it's, it's implementing what was proposed as part of the concept plan. Mm -hmm. So if they wanted to come in with a building that was twice as big, it would need to come back in front of you to amend the concept plan and, and that detailed plan to review it. So the detailed plans, as long as they're consistent with the approved master plan, go through staff. But there is public noticing, um, posting of the site, um, mailing to with everybody within 300 feet, notify the neighborhood association when that application would come in. I see. Okay. Um, and can you clarify the the new, uh, uh, clarify the new path? proposed. Okay. It, I'm, I'm looking at um, the phase four uh, map. You got it. Yes. I okay. Do. So, so when this when this document was was issued, um, the thought was is there I can see on the bottom left the connect new pedestrian path into existing. Um, it was proposed in this document as phase four. Are we proposing now the same thing for phase one? Correct. Okay. In 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 and, in and around that location right there, right? Correct. Okay. Thanks. That's I just want to understand that. I just had. Uh, Couple clarifications. When uh, you talk, talk about a step back, understand that we're trying to reduce the massing in the front. 
step back, is that a significant step back, or are we talking about just a um, – I know it's early to talk about design, but mm -hmm. we're assuming there's going to be a, a major uh, setback of over – once you get past 30 feet, I believe, right? Correct. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm a little hesitant because we don't have actual design of the building. Right. Um, there will be a step back. Now, okay. if it's 50% or 30% or 70, I, I, we, I, the applicant hasn't gotten that far. Right. Okay. Um, you know, I think it's, right. I think, I think it's important to note that whatever that step back is, it's going to be reviewed by the historic review board right. to make sure it's appropriate. But we haven't identified a numeric, um, either distance or percentage of step back. Okay. As, as part of this. And just a clarification, um, you said it was administrative about connecting to the nearest water or nearest uh, sewer? Yeah. It's, 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 it's more of our engineering department working just with... Just saying. It yeah, seems we, obvious, but I guess... I, I it is. Okay. It's a little... All right. That's what I was curious about. Okay. Um, and Dan took care of the other one. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. At this time, we'll have staff, or I'm sorry, the applicant come forward, and uh, if you want to do that. Good evening, Chair Paul and Planning Commissioners. Um, at the last Planning Commission meeting, we, we provided a fairly lengthy presentation, and um, with the exception of Commissioner Groner, we didn't feel it would be particularly um, good use of your time to present you the same information. So um, we are here certainly to answer any questions. As, as Tony Conkel mentioned, we did submit a little more information that which you received in your packets or tonight. And um, so I, we, we, we have a PowerPoint with, but um, Unless Commissioner Groner would like to have a presentation, we thought we would just sit back and listen. Okay. And then, of course, later we might, you know, we perhaps. Sure, have you'll some have an opportunity later. for rebuttal. Yeah. No problem okay. with that. Great. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. <coughs> All right, at this time we'll open up the public hearing <clears throat> for those in the public that would like to speak. We One moment. Uh, I'll, I'll address you. Just okay, go ahead. Well, please go please come forward and, and just. Denise McGriff representing the McLaughlin Neighborhood Association and all the neighbors that are here. Uh, we discussed at our last meeting that we would like to request that the Planning Commission allow for um, at least five minutes per person due to the nature of this particular request, we don't feel that in light of the situation that three minutes is going to be adequate. So we're just putting that out there. Is there anything else? Just because of the number yeah, of different okay. issues. Right. So thank you. Thank you. I'll take that on advisement. So um, as we open up the public hearing, uh, we'll, we will be open to listening to all of your concerns. Um, We'll decide time-wise here in just a moment what we would like to pursue. Um, we will be respectful of you, and we hope that you can be respectful of us and each other. Uh, I will not allow any comments uh, unless you are at the table and unless you have identified yourself. <clears throat> so with that, I will ask the Planning Commission what you'd like to do about time. We had agreed to three minutes. And 10 minutes to, for the uh, recognized neighborhood associations. Would you like to change that? I guess my, I mean, my question or, or thought would be with the number of folks in the room, if we go ahead and limit it to three, um, and if we feel like there are more, if, if more uh, questions that haven't been answered, could we not continue the hearing at that point for further discussion? I, I'm just I'm looking at the room wondering how long five minutes would take uh, and and if there are, are actually that number of issues to get through why not set aside an, yet another meeting if that's the case okay. how many how many comment cards do we have right now we're counting them quickly sure Fourteen. 
Okay. Well, I guess my thought is that um, and this is what I'd like. I would like to see the Neighborhood Association go for first and address the issues because I believe that the Neighborhood Association has been integral in this discussion. And if those, if they don't address all the issues during their time, um, perhaps that will allow other people uh, to drop some of the time off theirs so they don't have to repeat what what has to be said. Um, and I, I guess I'm not terribly concerned about the five minutes. Uh, I would like to pursue it and get through it quickly because there are a lot of people here. And that's why our limitation to three minutes it has nothing to do with we don't want to hear you. We certainly do. Um, so what would you, how would you like to pursue? Well, uh, yeah, I, I guess Lisboa. my feeling on this is, um, you know, our, our, tri our the way we've done it for the last five and a half years is three minutes. But nobody's actually ever asked from the standpoint for five minutes. So. It sort of opens it up for me. Uh -huh. Otherwise, I'd say three minutes. Um, but nobody's ever asked for, uh, as a general rule, if we could have five minutes. So I can good either way. You guys go. Yeah, I think in the interest of listening to um, what people, what concerns people have to to say, that that I'm I'm okay with going, uh, listening for an extra two minutes. If uh, if the point can't be made in three minutes, I'm willing to listen for five minutes. Okay. Okay. So that's what it sounds like. That's where we're headed. So five minutes. Uh, yes, sir. Excuse me. Uh, my name is William Gifford with the McLaughlin Association, and I did want to just point out that we did have some pre-planning, uh, pre-testimony meetings, and we have been trying to streamline and not do a lot of redundant testimony to waste your time, but we did plan it so that we have some opening remarks. We have sort of a schedule of who would like to speak, and then we'd like to wrap up with the neighborhood position. Sure. What, whatever, however, whatever works for you. I, I, I just thought maybe that would, that would create, if you were to present your case, perhaps then we wouldn't have a lot of redundant comments. But if you've already done that, I'm fine with that. I think that, there, that most people aren't going to be taking their full five minutes anyway. Okay, well, that's, that's fine with me. And do we want to stick with 10 minutes for the, the Neighborhood Association? Okay, then that's what it'll be. 10 minutes for Neighborhood Association, uh, recognized Neighborhood Associations, and five minutes per applicant. So at this time, <clears throat> We will start with uh, those. I'm not sure who's driving the show here. Um, it, it's my, did, Denise, do you want to come up and lay out who should speak? Nope. No. Well, William. William. Oh. William is okay. William, do you I love order a then? Who will yes, come next? I love a plan. <laughs> Just I want to make sure that everybody gets signed up, and anybody that speaks, please give a, a copy for the record. And um, Mr. Gifford turned in uh, two... Uh, two letters. And I'll have and you repeat enter, that. I'm going to enter them both as uh, exhibits D and E. And if you'll repeat that comment as you walked away, I didn't. We didn't get that on the record. I, I submitted two uh, two written testimonies. One is a transcript of my initial opening comments, and the other will be a summation at the at the end of the neighborhood presentation. Thank you. Ready when you are. My name is William Gifford. I reside in Oregon City and am the duly elected co-chair of the McLaughlin Neighborhood Association. It is within the boundaries of that neighborhood that activities in the Oregon City Public Works Master Plan are proposed. Common courtesy demands that we express appreciation for all the good works that OCPW performs for our neighborhood and for our city. We also appreciate all the work done by them in preparing the master plan, attending our neighborhood meetings, and attempting to address our concerns. Thanks are also due to the Planning Commission for allowing continuances for the assimilation and examination of a significant amount of information regarding this plan. Many neighbors are prepared to offer testimony supporting this decision from various perspectives. My introductory testimony addresses three overarching issues. Number one, site selection. Despite staff's referral to the December 7th, 21st, um, 2005 City Commission report regarding the Operation Facilities Plan and its subsequent adoption, perusing the DECA architecture report yields this item. During the course of the study, the City decided not to pursue the relocation of the facilities to a new site. The decision was made for the following reasons. Included among them is neighborhood support. And it says, by maintaining its presence in the neighborhood and planning for future growth, the Operations Facilities supports jobs and activities in the Central City. 
The M&A rejects this and many of the other arguments presented on this point, uh, presented on this point at many levels. The preferred site is inadequate for growth and requires purchasing additional property as it becomes available so that some of the projected costs remain uncertain. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission is not the proper venue to consider this question. m and contends that it is and demands the Planning Commission to recommend to City Council that staff reconsider the location of the expanded and consolidated public works facility and find another site that would, be more, that would more adequately support its needs. Second overarching issue is neighborhood impact. The McLaughlin Historic Neighborhood is one of the premier jewels in the crown of the city. Staff has argued that Public Works has been in its current location for 50 years. And if it were to continue at its current size of operations, with a few adjustments, we could enjoy its continuance as a good neighbor. <coughs> However, doubling its number of employees and, despite arcane manipulation of statistics, increasing the amount of large truck traffic in the neighborhood does not constitute continuing at its current size of operation. The plan makes no mention of mitigating the substantial quality of life impacts to the neighborhood. Number three overarching issue is bending the rules. The city should adhere to its own municipal codes the same as it would uh, any other developer, setting an example to other development and holding itself to its own high standards. We recognize that many or most developments require some give and take, but we believe that five requested adjustments to the OC municipal code and 18 conditions of approval indicate an excessive amount of concessions. Good evening. My name is Joyce Gifford, a resident of the McLaughlin neighborhood of Oregon City. I'm sorry. And we will be entering her testimony as Exhibit uh, F. I want to thank the city staff and the consultants who came to the McLaughlin Neighborhood Association three times to explain this public works master plan. When I saw the design concepts for the upper yard, I was impressed with the planned landscaping and environmental considerations they indicated. I was concerned with the scale of the planned four-story building that connects the upper and lower areas, but expected a compromise solution could be reached. But upon further reading, reading of the master plan and walking the area, I noticed problems that greatly alarmed me as to why this facility cannot be allowed in this location. The narrow roads make both access and egress a challenge. A fueling station in the upper yard requiring tanker trucks to maneuver into this tight area was presented as, an es as essential for this facility by Public Works at a neighborhood meeting. But upon reading the master plan, I found no reference to a fueling station. And this indicates to me the applicant's recognition of the constraints of this site. The unstable basalt cliff makes building on this location treacherous and expensive. The increased truck traffic and employee truck and employee traffic is unacceptable for a residential neighborhood and this is exasperated by the fact that City Hall is moving here. I realized that in 2005 the city did a cursory look at other city properties six acres or larger and chose this as the best location for expansion. It was mentioned in our neighborhood meetings that although this site is quote less than ideal unquote the major reasons for choosing it were that the property is already owned by the city the zoning would not need to be changed, and they are already running public works from this location. Yes, public works began operations at this site 50 years ago and continues today. Over time, as the city has grown, so has the need for more large trucks and employees. While the South Center Street and John Adams sites are currently being used to run a portion of public works, the concept plan before you has a much larger scale. It is the scale of this expansion that is not consistent with history or a residential neighborhood. It should be noted that the plan also calls for purchasing some adjacent residences which would require rezoning. With only 2.2 acres of buildable land, this site will not be able to expand to meet future city needs. City boundaries and properties have changed since 2005 and another look must be taken to find a more suitable location. Building a public works facility of this magnitude at this location is dangerous, expensive, and irresponsible to the future citizens of Oregon City. I insist that the Planning Commission reject this proposal. If the applicant desires a single consolidated facility, you must require our city commissioners and public works to find another location with adequate access roads and enough buildable space to meet the current and future needs of Oregon City. And if 
when um, when folks come up to speak, if they can just let me know if they submitted something, we'll be able to get it and give it a exhibit number instead of me interrupting you every time. Okay. My name is Phil Rock. I live in uh, Oregon City. I did not submit any paperwork for you, but my my concern is the fueling station. The idea of driving fuel trucks through our neighborhood is not acceptable by most of us. I know uh, Clackamas County Road Department down in Abernathy, they one time had a fueling station. They decided to get rid of it because of the proximity to the Abernathy Creek and the extra cost of having a fuel person there fueling the trucks at night. Plus up here, apparently they plan on putting it next to a drainage system that's already on the property not a very good idea. I'm totally against the plan that they have here for the new compound, the rebuilding and enlarging of the compound. That's pretty much what I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. We can't. Yeah. Be uh, this is uh, Mr. Schrall. Correct. And we'll be entering his uh, exhibit as Exhibit G. First name Gary. Live at 102 Washington Street, directly north of the bluff that they're speaking on building the upper level on. I've um, <clears throat> done pretty extensive research as far as the history and uh, the geological part of the plan. I've got some issues that uh, I'd like to go over. Did you get your handouts? Uh, no. Would you like to hand these out? To the commissioners, yeah. Several of the subjects are just common sense. I mean, it's good to have them to look at, read over. The other fact that I wanted to deal with is uh, some of the historical and geological ends of the project. Uh, the first one I had is a site is a challenge to build on. Number one, the cost will be much more than a flat site, any way you look at it whether it's excavation, fence building, all of the above. It's just a common sense thing. I've built enough in my life, I know. The site will be more than difficult to use in the future. That's a flat, rather than a flat site. It's confined, confined area, which makes it more difficult in the future, the challenge there. Site is a challenge to as far as preserving the historical neighborhood in the area of cliffs and narrow streets. It's very obvious. Quite overlooked. Building site chosen on a basalt cliff with known rock slides above, below, without core samples. In my mind, I wouldn't be a contractor that would even come close to, you wouldn't do it. A contractor would probably not do that without core samples. And why it was looked into before that, I don't know. Uh, getting into the geological facts that have been overlooked, it's, it's one of the largest parks in the old part of Oregon City. It's the largest green space in the old part of Oregon City. It's one of the only places you can walk to and feel like you're in a historical area that you feel part of the past. One of the most natural and least disturbed areas in Oregon City. If anybody's walked it, you know that. If you haven't, you should. Geological history, mostly unknown. Would be unlikely that Native Americans didn't use it. I mean, it's 
very close to the falls. It was the property was actually a declaration of land claim by Archibald McKinley. He was the son in law to Peter Ogden, involved in the Whitman massacre. They brought back the Indians that were prosecuted afterwards. If that's not a definition of historical site, I don't know what is. He, uh, Ogden actually purchased a piece of property off his son-in-law, died there two years after, building a house. The house was near South End Road. They were both members of the fur trader, Bay, the Hudson Bay fur traders, and well known for their pioneer activity in Oregon Territory. One opposition I have is to the first street vacation due to the access of my property. I currently use first street as a drive to access my property. If it were vacated, part of the property would go to an adjoining property that would eliminate my driveway. I'd like to note a couple other things that uh, William McKinley was the first signer of the Society Const Constitution, which was actually before the Oregon Territory, or between the time of the Oregon, Oregon Territory being brought into view by the government. And I guess that pretty much sums up what I have. There's a couple of other things that I would like to read that was <coughs> proposed in the comprehensive plan of 2004, and it's just a paragraph. It would be difficult to find a community in the West more significant local, state, and regional heritage than Oregon City. As a seat of the first Provisional Government of Oregon Territory, capital of the Oregon Territory, and the first incorporated town west of the Rockies. Oregon City has many homes, commercial buildings, and sites that are related in its important place in history. Preservation of these communities, resources, landmark sites, historic buildings, and areas of architectural sites offers an opportunity to maintain and enhance Oregon City's unique identity. A well-developed Preservation program can benefit property owners, local historians, students, community spirit, and tourism, and an increase of appreciation residents have for their city's cultural heritage. That was put in by uh, 2004 by the Oregon City Comprehensive Plan. And I think that kind of tells you that uh, there's a lot of history in this area that. Uh, a lot of people didn't know about. I've asked a lot of people in this whole room in the past. Um, hey, Jerry. Very few people. Have, uh, you're, you're over your time, so you're over by a minute here. So. Okay. Just very few people know about it. Thank so. you. Thank you. Hello. My hey. name is Gordon Wilson. I live at 107 Jefferson Street, Oregon City, Oregon. Uh, I just have some reasons why I'm against the Oregon City Public Works Central Master Plan CP09-01. <clears throat> <clears throat> the Water Board Park site is not city central and is not big enough for current or future needs. The Water Board Park site is only accessible by two narrow cliffside roads, barely wide enough for one vehicle, and, are pr and they are pretty much impassable during inclement weather. The Water Board Park site is surrounded by a scenic park and historic neighborhood, so industrial development here would not be compatible with the surrounding areas, violating city code. The Water Board Pikes Park site is surrounded by steep basalt cliffs, cliffs and no site-specific geologic study has been done. Grading here may cause landslides onto site and surrounding area houses. <clears throat> the Water Board Park site is part of an ancient native Oregon wetlands habitat full of priceless biodiversity, natural springs, native birds, native trees, and wildlife. I, I care about my neighbors and the historic McLaughlin neighborhood a great deal. 
and I don't think it's fair that the Oregon City Public Works Central Center Master Plan CP09-01 appropriates my neighbor's land, i.e. private property, into its design plans before the public works even owns the property. That's poor planning and not very nice. Thank you very much. Mr. Wilson's comments will be submitted as Exhibit C. Good evening. Frank Whelan, architect, Lake Oswego. Uh, together uh, with my stepson, Gordon Wilson, who just talked, and my wife, Valerie, we own the property at 107 Jefferson. <coughs> Commissioners, 2,500 years ago, Greeks met to plan how to develop a bluff above Athens. No river below, no falls, no verdant hillside in the opposite bank reaching down to the water's edge just a dry, flat plain below, maybe some olive trees. They built the Acropolis and the Parthenon. Tonight we're meeting to discuss building rock pits, gravel bins, and maintenance shops on our bluff above Oregon City. So much for Oregon City's declared public policy of protecting and enhancing improvements of aesthetic interest for the prosperity and welfare of the people. Planning recommends exempting the site from this public policy. So much for city planning goals. Public work didn't start the master planning process with an open mind and an interest in the well-being of the citizens of Oregon City. They started with empty pockets and an interest in the well-being of public works. Their lack of due diligence in selecting a site should convince you of their self-interest with little or no money, unwilling to wait until they could raise money, and unwilling to make a concerted effort to find a more appropriate parcel, they opted for the present site. Like a cheap suit, it doesn't fit. And no amount of code variances will make it fit. Based on an investigation of site area required from Milwaukee and Tualatin's Public, work department, public Works Departments, Oregon City Public Works would require between 15 and 20 acres. And a side note, that's probably low. Excluding rock outcroppings and unbuildable land, Public Work presently owns two and a half acres of usable land, about 15% of what's required to meet their needs. The master plan submitted by Public Works should be rejected. The plan is predicated on ownership of the armory. They do not own the armory. The plan also relies on the purchase of 15 residential properties, quotation marks, as they become available. Public Works does not own these properties. They are not for sale. They are not zoned institutional. And Public Works does not have the money to purchase them now and most probably not in the future. The armory was given to the National Guard as a patriotic act. In its own self-interest, Public Works now wants it back. Given the most active period for the Guard since World War II, they seem little interested in abandoning that building. If Public Works feels that they're almost ready to complete an agreement, then I would say they're almost ready to submit their master plan, but not today. Public Works should be treated like all applicants, private or public without preference, without prejudice. It would be fair to ask the Planning Commission tonight, what other master plan would you approve where the applicant does not own and does not have options on 85% of the land they are master planning? The application lacks a report and approval from the fire chief a statement that no comments were submitted by the, chart, by the fire chief is not an approval. With the closing of the road access on the upper parcel at 1st and John Adams Street, a single lane, dead end street is created. Turning radiuses for fire equipment at alleyways at 1st and 2nd would appear to be inadequate. If on street parking is eliminated to allow police and fire access, approximately 20 properties will be affected. 
this would require or should require a public hearing and be resolved before the master plan submitted. The ac application also lacks an approval from Parks and Recreation as to the acceptability of a zero property setback line along Water Board Park, suggesting that existing parking lots on South Center Street could be utilized to access the new connection to Water Board Park is like suggesting that the public park the cor cars at the courthouse to access the McLaughlin House. The handicap will appreciate traversing a 40-foot high bluff on a ramp. And the fire chief will appreciate the public parking in the fire lane adjacent to the trailhead. Adequate parking at the trailhead is imperative. Excuse the me. new You're going to need to summarize here. Okay, I have two paragraphs and I'm at that point. The numerous variances to the code requirements that Public Works is requesting are too numerous to address in detail in three minutes. The majority relate to increasing usable area of the site. Had Public Works made a good faith effort to find an acceptable site and that this was the best of alternatives, most of us would support most of these variances. However, they did not make that effort and if so told the McLaughlin neighborhood group. If they decide to proceed with planning expansion on the site that is at variance uh, excuse me, by approving variances that a bet public that should not public commission <laughs> planning commission should not aid them by approving variances that a bet public works bad judgment. Three reasons to reject this application. Does not represent the interest of 75 percent of the property owners. Application does not meet Oregon City planning goals and objectives. The requested variances in our attempt by the applicant to increase usable land necessitated by selecting an inappropriate site. Now, in conclusion, to paraphrase O.J. Simpson's attorney, Johnny Cochran, no. if the site does... That, excuse me. I, I believe Commissioner Lajoie was speaking, yeah. sir. Sorry. Excuse me. Your, your time's up. I, I'm sorry. I'm just... I'm just tasked with the time, and in fairness to everybody. I, I understand. May I just finish the last you sentence? You have my time. Okay, I that's fine. It. Fine. Okay. To paraphrase OJ's attorney, Johnny Cochran, if the site doesn't fit, you must vote to resubmit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have no documentation. My name is Bill Daniels. I've been a resident of Oregon City for 35 years, and I've enjoyed um, <clears throat> having Public Works as a good neighbor. Um, I think this is the time, though, that um, the city needs to uh, reflect on a better location for Public Works. Uh, I didn't prepare a document tonight. I've had some other issues in front of me, but I do want to say <clears throat> that I think there are other possibilities out there that the city already owns land that would... <clears throat> um, serve their purpose and that is probably more centrally located to the city. We know which growth the city is to the south, to the east, and uh, this certainly doesn't meet that requirement. Uh, as a livability issue, and that's what I'm here about tonight, um, having more trucks coming through, and we will have more trucks as time goes on through our neighborhoods, old roads as they are, um, is, is not something that <coughs> we need in this city and it certainly isn't um, something that's um, efficient in terms of uh, transportation issues and, and getting their work done on time. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Stewart and I did submit written testimony. We'll enter uh, Ms. Stewart's uh, letter as Exhibit I. Hi, my name is Terry Stewart. I reside in Oregon City. I'm a resident of the McLaughlin Historic District. I also own two rental homes and a fourplex in the neighborhood. Uh, my children and their families reside in two of those rental homes. I also work as a real estate broker and I specialize in the Oregon City market, so I have a vested interest. Not only do I live in the neighborhood, I also sell the neighborhood. I am wholeheartedly against the Oregon City Public Works master plan of locating this facility in the McLaughlin Historic District. I'm here tonight to talk about the impact to our neighborhood. I'm speaking mo not only for myself, but my neighbors that surround me. We love our neighborhood. Over the years, we have collectively spent thousands upon thousands of hours fixing up our houses, landscaping the yards, 
planting trees for the city, volunteering and donating our time, our money, to the various improvement projects and community activities and fundraisers, all with the same goal of making the McLaughlin Historic District a more desirable place where people will want to live and raise their families. The transformation that has occurred in our neighborhood over the last 10 to 15 years is truly amazing. Where there were multitudes of rental houses in disrepair, there are now homeowners with pride of ownership. Where the majority of the homes were mostly adult occupied, you now see families residing. Our, our, trees, our streets are lined with trees, there's flower baskets on our corners, and the homes are being restored. I'd like to touch on um, one item that uh, Mr. Conkle brought up in his staff report, and that's the limited visibility on John Adams Street. Last week, I took a walk around the streets that the plan proposes to be the exit route for the heavy equipment vehicles on John Adams Street between 1st and 5th. This is what I observed within one block of that route. Families out on walks, bikers riding by, joggers running by. On 3rd Street, three kids were playing Barbies in front of their house. Three kids were riding bikes up and down the street. Five kids were playing softball on one corner, and three kids were throwing Frisbees on the other. On 4th Street, two kids were riding scooters, two were riding bikes, four kids were playing basketball on the corner, and three kids were running up and down the middle of John Adams Street trying to catch a dog. According to the Oregon City School District Transportation Department, appro approximately 40 grade school children catch Bus 91 uh, between Center and Jackson and 1st and 5th. This total, they say, does not include, the, you know, obviously the preschoolers or children past the sixth grade or those that are driven to and from school by their parents. So obviously the number of children living in that section of the neighborhood is much, much higher. We are all very concerned about the danger to our children by having heavy equipment vehicles as well as increased traffic that will daily use our streets for access. Building this facility within the boundaries of a residential neighborhood should never have been considered as an option. I am not using the objection of not in our neighborhood, but rather not in any residential neighborhood. We are, we are already going to be accommodating the new city hall as well as that we currently accommodate other commercial and public service facilities on our borders. Now you are asking us to have the expanded public works facility right in the middle of our neighborhood. And one final note. As a 28-year 28 28-year 28 veteran in the real estate business, I can tell you without a doubt that locating a commercial industrial facility within a res residential area will cause a decline in property values by those living around the entrance on center and the exit all along John Adams. Those folks will absorb a 5 to 10 percent uh, reduction in their property value because of noise and nuisance and traffic issues, and I think it's unfair to ask those people to absorb that loss. One final note, I think if this plan is approved and as time goes by when these people get sick of the noise and the nuisance and the traffic on their, around their homes and they want to sell, I hope all the people that are so passionately in support of locating this facility will step up and buy those homes. So, thank you. Thank you. There's two seats. Fill them up. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Is this working? Is it on? Push the button there at the bottom. It's green. It's okay. It's okay. on. Go ahead. And the fact that you do have written testimony, unfortunately, because of the power failure in her computer, she wasn't able to print it out and bring it tonight. And we would like to ask the commission's indulgence that we could email that to him. May I? Can you hold over for that? Uh, I think you should probably wait and decide that after. Yeah. We'll wait. Which one is it? Just one of these. And, the, and this is the... Um, William, unless you put... There it goes. So we got one. This is the yeah. Okay. All right. Oh. Oh. Did we go forward already? Okay. Paula Blackwell, three zero six South Center Street, Oregon City. Issues addressed in the presentation: truck turning, road widths, and rock falls. 
truck turning issues. Currently, this facility requires truck drivers to make illegal and unsafe turns off of John Adams into South Center Street. Can you see that <coughs> this is the double yellow line here? Are you going? Okay, that was back. Trucks are required to cross the double line into oncoming lane and sometimes into the property across the street in order to complete the turn. With the exception of large trucks using the site, expansion of large trucks using the site, the activity can only be expected to increase in frequency. <coughs> the road is also considered an access road for emergency vehicles, some of which are considerably larger than the truck shown above. The road is also considered an access road for emergency vehicles, some of which are, oh, same. The only solution to the above issues of trucks turning the road with, which has been proposed by the applicant, in fact, the only solution possible to make the site safe and, and legal is to acquire additional residential properties. Issues regarding this solution, the MNA is generally opposed to further encroachment of city property into their historic neighborhood. The acquisition is not planned until phase four of the plan leaving the illegal and unsafe activities to continue and even grow worse. The total cost of acquisition, both future property value and probable litigation fees have not been adequately estimated by the applicant. This is the rock wall near the proposed site and these are where these boulders are coming out of the wall. This is where the site's gonna be up here. Oh, there's gonna be a proposed sidewalk down here. This is the retaining wall. This is a boulder that recently fell out um, when some tree trimming trucks went down the road. This is a boulder that fell out of my neighbor's yard when a truck delivery was made, and that's their cat, and it landed up against their house, and it came out of right there. It just fell off and rolled into their house, and it took two big public works men to move it. Conclusion, the current use of the public works site is unsafe at any speed. And I think they s talked about 25 miles per hour, but 20 is really fast in that area. Expand expanded use under the proposed master plan would be even more unsafe to public employees, their clients, and the neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you. The PowerPoint presentation will be entered as Exhibit J. stuff like that and there's not going to be a decrease there's going to be an increase per the tables and in the report it said there was going to be a decrease but it's going to be up to 280 trips a day in an eight-hour period and there's just little facts like that a lot of things I just kind of saw that were um, interesting to me that I'd like to summarize and send to you if that's possible um, I can send it to Tony and um, have it and forward it if I that think, would be I think okay. the planning the commission planning. Will, will address that. Okay, thank All right. you. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Valerie Bielen, and I'm the uh, property owner um, of record for uh, 107 Jefferson Street. And when I moved to Oregon 45 years ago, oh, my name is Valerie Whelan. Okay, I gave you the, the, um, the testimony. When I moved to Oregon 45 years ago, I began to study Oregon history. When my son was old enough, we would spend time visiting numerous historical sites, including the McLaughlin House, the Promenade, and the Locks. When out-of-town guests uh, come to visit, uh, Oregon City is always on my agenda. In 2005, our family had the opportunity to purchase the Randall Crawford House. 
uh, the last four, four years, my son has spent a great deal of time, effort, and money restoring this home. Many, many neighbors are doing the same. It was my impression the city was also interested in the livability of the historic district because of their recent enhancements to the streets. I find it incomprehensible that Oregon City Planning Commission would consider a project which will have such a negative impact on one of the most significant sites in the Northwest and the center of the Oregon Territory. Ms. Whalen's testimony has been entered as Exhibit K. Hi, I have, my name is Curtis Sajalo. I live at 6163rd, right at the bottom of uh, John Adams, going straight up to the armory. Um, the kids that she was talking about were probably those two kids right over there, playing basketball in the corner. Um, half the football team has been to this house. Um, I've seen, I've lived it for three years. I see people walk up and down the street all day, take pictures with their kids, kids right up and down the street. Family walk with their with their dogs, their children. It's it's a really beautiful area, and I don't see why you guys would want to tear that up. You know, it. I looked up the uh, it's the Isaac Farr house. He he all that land was farmed by him back in the early 1800s, and we actually have a ghost that lives in the house with us. Um, it's it's a really beautiful area. I don't know why you guys would want to tear that up. You know. It, like he said, he walks it all the time. These people walk it all the time. I can't see that tree line just going down. All those cars, we have trucks going up and down there anyway, and it is a nuisance. It's loud, and that's all I got to say. <laughs> Ms. Roth's testimony will be exhibit, entered as Exhibit L. Uh, I'm Kathy Roth, and I live at 211 uh, Jefferson Street, but my home fronts John Adams um, immediately on 3rd Avenue where it narrows down on um, goes into the tree canopy. Um, I would like to preface my statements with um, both the reports that we were handed tonight by um, EKS Associates and Michael Miner and Associates have been contested tonight by Commissioner Stein and by information given to us by Tonal Conkle. So I don't believe that we can take those reports as absolute. Uh, there are quite a few discrepancies in them from what we've heard here tonight as far as traffic volumes and, and different things. I do not believe the impact um, to be insignificant as these reports suggest. So that with that we'll go to, I'm here tonight to the, oppose the Public Works proposal of developing the Cliffs area of the McLaughlin neighborhood and closing the southwest access to John Adams Street. Diesel exhaust, or DE, is a complex mixture of hundreds of constituents in either a gas or particle form. Gaseous components of DE include carbon dioxide, oxygen, nitrogen, water vapor, carbon monoxide, nitrogen compounds, sulfur compounds, and numerous low molecular weight hydrocarbons. Among the gaseous hydrocarbon components of DE are individually known to be of toxicological relevance are the aldehydes, for example, formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, acrolein, benzene, 1,3-butadiene, and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and nitro-PAHs. Diesel exhaust and several derivatives are known carcinogens, both lung and other cancers. Asthma inducers cause pulmonary function reduction and radiographic abnormalities, in addition to other unknowns. In addition, the PM2 of diesel exhaust, which is the particulate size, is such that it is buried very deeply in all body tissues, especially in lung tissues. So it, in addition to being carcinogens and toxics, it is an invasive irritant that is pervasive. As a scientist and healthcare worker, my concern is with the health issues that come from many aspects of this proposal. This concern extends to our neighborhood and especially to the part of John Adams that is covered with dense forest canopy. This canopy serves as an enclosure that will keep particulates close to the surface, thereby concentrating the DE and the PM2s to those homes and pedestrians using this area. The city has old equipment which does not comply with current EPA standards. 
This exacerbates, exacerbates the DE effects. I have provided in my uh, exhibit an address to the most recent EPA findings on diesel exhaust. It's a 700-page document, so I didn't want to print it up for you tonight. Um, this is a family neighborhood with many children. This street is extremely beautiful, and it's a resource and an entrance to the park area above. Given the documentation that I have provided in your packets, I believe that the proposed concept development plan is a recipe for human, animal, environmental, and aesthetic disaster. Late this afternoon, I received additional and even more frightening study evidence of new health issues positively linked to DE, including risk of death to sensitive subpopulations, retardation in developing fetuses, ischemic heart disease, myocardial infarction, etc. These problems will only increase as the use of this becomes increased, and they will become more severe as public work, quote, intends to significantly significantly expand their service, end quote. This additional information was supplied by Dr. Rhonda Spencer of Loma Linda University, a former Oregon City resident. She has agreed to become my collaborator on any studies we would like to, to uh, go forward with and to serve as an expert if needed in this area. Just because a practice has been in place for many years does not mean that that practice is best practice. It is time to rethink the treasure that we have in our own city designated historic neighborhood and protect the population that enlivens that neighborhood. Thank you. If I could, just for clarification, uh, Ms. Uh, Roth referenced a link to a 700 page document. Um, so, you know, not, not to be argumentative, we appreciate all the information you're providing us, but it needs to be entered into the record in order to be able to use it. Um, at the conclusion of the hearing, you're probably going to consider if you want to continue the hearing or not, um, and, and in what math method you'd like to do that. Um, if, if, if the commission decides to um, continue the hearing and leave it open, and you do want those 700 or parts of it put in, you need to get that to the city in order to put it into the record. Yeah, I have just it because order. Of, what's that? I have it on order from EPA. It'll be okay. here this week. Okay. So. Just just to clarify that it is not it has not been submitted into the record until we do receive a hard copy just because of the appeal and we need to have everything on hand. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, I've just returned to the Oregon <coughs> City area and um, Your name? I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Kathleen Cook. I'm an educator. And uh, I used to have a house at 6th and Monroe and I now am at 132 Woodfield Court up um, off of Telford around that area. Um, upon finding out um, that the um, what you're considering, um, the first thing that comes to my mind is that area already has um, chemicals that are coming up from the paper mill from the river. Um, living in Oregon City, as I have for about eight years, um, I'd like to I'd like to see Oregon City continue to improve. Um, for the people that are that are living in the area, and as a lot of people have testimony this evening, improving on the properties that they have. I have driven by that area. I've gone up into that area. Beautiful little homes. People who are used to very tranquil, tranquil living. Walking up and down that that little roadway. Uh, that's a very private little area up there, and there must be another site in Oregon City where the uh, utilities company can expand to. Red soils, there's got to be another industrial area. Let's protect our neighborhoods, protect the lifestyles that the people have um, grown accustomed to and that are working towards. Let's protect the quality of life for people that are dedicated to living in Oregon City. That's my request. Okay, thank you. I have uh, a Mr. Jill Jen Ms. Jill Jensen, Mr. Gus Jensen uh, indicated they opposed. They didn't indicate if they'd like to speak tonight. No. no? Seeing okay. no. Thank okay. you. The last one I have is Ms. McGriff. Please 
Griff, 815 Washington Street, um, representing uh, sort of the land use portion of the neighborhood and also just summarizing and concurring uh, with some of the things that we've already said. I think that you all know that this is a somewhat of a difficult situation for us in the sense that uh, as has stated we've cohabitated for the last 50 years but I think the thing it's important to note that the institutional district or institutional zone was I think probably created to accommodate some of the sort of incompatible or non-residential type uses in our neighborhood. So we have this institutional zone district which talks about uh, the purpose of it is to ensure the compatibility of these types of districts with surrounding areas. It also talks about fostering, uh, helping to foster the growth of major institutional uses while identifying and mitigating impacts of such growth on surrounding properties. And I guess we would submit that major institutions such as a very large public works department or a fuel station or even a sewer treatment plant probably don't belong in residential neighborhoods. And that's really where the, the rub is, is that the master plan that was submitted does a great job of identifying the needs and the wants of public works operations. It does analyze the strengths and weaknesses of the current facility. But what it really doesn't do or get to the heart of is the analysis of the impacts of the proposed development on the surrounding community and neighborhood. It talks about jobs for residents. It talks about benefit to Oregon City. And that's all fine and dandy. But this is not in the middle of the Rivercrest neighborhood. It's not in Park Place. It's not in anybody else's neighborhood. It's in this neighborhood. And such that we're concerned about us bearing the full brunt of those activities that do benefit everybody else. Because they aren't driving through Rivercrest to, on a snowy night or the, on a, you know, backing up and doing all these other things. So it's, it's again, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult for us to be in this, in this particular situation. I, I think it's interesting that the report does outline the, the need for some variances and some exceptions, and it talks about let's go through the master plan process because then we can kind of just vary those. So just quickly, in terms of the, the noise mitigation, I think there was a recommendation for future notification. And I think that it would not be really difficult to include that information in an in operational plan that that becomes a requirement instead of something that's just, well, practicable. If we can do it, if it's reasonable, we'll do it. Alternate sites, again, I think you've heard a lot of testimony about that particular issue. And I think the situation has changed in terms of our city growth and anticipated growth. Actually, personally, I hope we don't get that big. But, you know, if we do, 2.2 um, acres is not really going to be adequate. In a lot of places, the master plan notes that putting up fencing and landscaping are going to be mitigating, and so won't the landscaping be pretty and nice? And it really doesn't get to the, to the point of if you've got a large institutional building adjacent to where you live, <laughs> that landscaping, while being nice, isn't really going to cut it. Lipstick on a pig. So I think you've also heard information from the neighbors about the streets not being adequate and negatively impacting surrounding areas. I also would submit that the conditions of approval, particularly 17 and 18, do not give any certainty to the situation regarding John Adams, South John Adams, or South Center Street. It was interesting to note that the conditions as written don't account for any other activity of pedestrian and bicycle access other than public works employees crossing the street. So there's some things missing there. We'd like to see if the parking lot has to stay there. It'd be nice to have houses there instead. That Why not just reduce parking and have adequate landscaping and, adequ and parking? It was previously said that uh, there were no comments from police and fire. We have a concern about that. The letter from SHPO hasn't been addressed. And then there are the impacts of each proposal, besides those already identified, that we've identified noise, traffic, parking, that have to do with the fact that the facility doubling in size and possibly more in the future will irreparably harm the neighborhood and the surrounding properties. We're concerned, again, about the adjustments to the code. We respectfully disagree with the Historic Review Board. We know that they want to review it, but we don't really feel that an adjustment to a height of 60 feet when there isn't any precedent for anything that tall, that large, or that high in the neighborhood, and that it will impact our neighborhood. We know that there's a proposed Type 2 in the future, but Type 2 really doesn't get to the crux of something that we feel needs to be and be compatible with the McLaughlin Conservation District. 
Another item is the uh, institutional buildings. I think that we have a McLaughlin Conservation District. Many of us work very hard to get standards in place. And regardless of whether they're pole-type buildings, we really think that they should have some sort of material or finishes to give them a better and attractive appearance, and it shouldn't just be waved just because they think nobody can see it. That's, that's really not acceptable. We have a concern about the number of parking spaces that are proposed to be in the neighborhood. We do have a lot of parking lots, but there's nothing in there about carpooling, van pooling. You know, does everybody that works at Public Works have to drive their own car and be there and have all those cars there? We find that, uh, we, I guess in a lot of ways, we kind of like to have a do-over. Uh, we can't really support the approval of this master plan as submitted. We have major concerns, again, about the activities and the impacts on the neighborhood, and we're concerned about the fact that a lot of things are left to the future, that, well, maybe this will happen, maybe that will happen. We'd like a lot more certainty about what will happen. Since we all live there, we've invested there, and you're asking an awful lot of us, of our neighborhood, to take this particular impact. It's not that Public Works isn't valuable as a facility, but to double it in size and possibly even more doesn't work. The Oregon City Public Works Operation Facilities Plan staff update dis dated December 7, 2005 includes this comment from the executive summary of the DECA architecture report. Quote, after analyzing the future needs of the operations division and touring similar facilities, the study concluded that to consolidate the shops and offices for all the divisions and to provide adequate vehicle, equipment, and bulk storage for the next 10 years, the department will require at least a six-acre site. The current core site at 122 South Center Street, where most of the divisions and offices are located, occupies approximately 4.5 acres, including the area on the hillside above the offices. Given the steep terrain, the actual usable area is 2.2 acres. After exploring several new sites within the city limits, and this is my emphasis, the city concluded that it would be politically and financially more responsible to not consider relocating the entire operations division to another site. Therefore, the study focuses on ways to accommodate and expand most of the facilities on and around the current site." End quote. The Planning Commission would surely agree that the political and financial conditions of the city have certainly changed since 2005. However, the operations facility plan adopted puts public works in a box. Basically, they've been directed to make the existing site work, regardless of physical or social constraints. The evening's testimony makes the case that the existing site cannot work for the proposed expansion and consolidation of public works needs. In section 6.4, called traffic access of the above mentioned 2005 report, quote, most of the operations vehicles enter the site, uh, the upper site from Center Street, which requires navigating a hairpin turn, you've seen the slides, with no shoulder and a steep narrow access drive. The road does not meet, quote, the road does not meet current Oregon City street design standards. It is particularly dangerous during icy weather conditions when sanding trucks use the road to load sand from the upper site, and here's my emphasis. Widening the road and improving the turning radius will require purchasing additional property at the intersection of South John Adams and South Center Street. Obviously, this plan calls for acquisition of additional property in the residential neighborhood and its subsequent rezoning. These costs have not been adequately estimated. Property costs and inevitable litigation fees would reasonably add substantial cost to the project encroachment of the historic McLaughlin neighborhood is not acceptable. Consequently, after months of examination of the master plan, many meetings of the general membership, the steering committee, and subgroups of neighbors, the McLaughlin Neighborhood Association steering committee has explicitly voted, and the McLaughlin Neighborhood Association general membership has, ex has implicitly voted to reject the, repo the proposed plan, including the 18 recommended commissions conditions of approval submitted by the Community Development Department. The McLaughlin Neighborhood Association respectfully requests the Planning Division to advise the City Council to direct staff to reconsider the location of the expanded and consolidated public works facility and find another site that would more adequately support its needs. So we want to thank you again for listening to all of us. As you know, this is, hasn't been easy. Uh, we appreciate the time that's been put in. You picking me? Okay, there it is.
didn't hear myself for a minute. You have anybody else? Maybe Sorry. not. Maybe Is there anyone else? Anyone else in the audience that would like to speak on this matter? For? Against? Neither? Either? Please come forward okay. and All right. introduce yourself, All please. Right. I'm Steve Ediger. I'm a neighbor to the Roths, and I'm a builder. I built historic homes, uh, mostly in Portland, although uh, I'm a West Lynn uh, resident right now, and I recently noticed how Oregon City has uh, done a fabulous job in uh, really upgrading this whole area. I've bought a few lots now, and I'm anticipating uh, building and uh, I just want to encourage you to uh, do just keep keep up the good work in uh, uh, fostering and building up the uh, residential aspects of the city. Thank you. Appreciate that, sir. Can you please fill out a uh, comment form so yeah. we can get your info? I started filling it out for him. <laughs> Any anyone else like to speak at this time? Okay, thank you very much. Rebuttal. Yeah. So next up, rebuttal from the applicant. Thank you, Chair Powell, Commissioners. Um, it's probably one of the more difficult moments of my life. <laughs> but um, I feel like to really adequately address the concerns that have been expressed tonight while we have addressed them in one of our previous memos, there is some, um, there were some new pieces of information that we would like to be able to um, give careful consideration to and a serious response. And um, for that, reason I would request that we continue this um, hearing and allow us to respond to uh, to again respond to many of the issues that have come up tonight okay <clears throat> so our uh, please okay. I, first first off um, I'd like to enter into the record exhibit M um, a letter submitted by uh, Miss Blackwell and then give it over to our attorney on what our hearing processes thank you all right we've had a couple of requests to leave the record open uh, to continue the proceeding the Commission has three choices um, the first one would be to deny the continuance request and make a decision right now um, I would not recommend that approach because new evidence has certainly been submitted this evening what Statute 197763-2B says that when new evidence is submitted, the, the decision maker either must continue the hearing or it has a second option, which is to leave the record open for written testimony. And the way that process works is you would leave the record open for seven days <laughs> for the applicant to respond to the new evidence that has been submitted in writing. The next seven days would be for all people to respond to that new evidence that the applicant has submitted. At that point the record would close to all evidence and argument except for the applicant who would get the last word. So it would be a three-week period all in all before you would return and the record at that point would close after the applicant submits their final argument and you would return to a hearing and have deliberation based on all of the written testimony and oral testimony that's been presented to this point. Okay. If you continue, I think you're looking at a continuance date of July 13th. Which is the third option. Which is the, th which is the third option. If you do decide to continue it, you might want to make real clear what you <coughs> expect to occur on the 13th. Okay. And I guess, um, you know, uh, as Mr. Rector did clarify, our next planning commission meeting would be July 13th, uh, 2009, Monday night. If you went with the second option, you know, tonight's 6, 622. So roughly, the applicant would have till next Monday, 629. Uh, then everyone else would have from 630 to 76. 
July 6th, and then you have July 7th to July 13th, which is the night of the next meeting for the applicant to try and round up their. It just it makes it hard. So you're probably looking at July 27th realistically to be able to get all the information to you in a reasonable amount of time. Give the applicant, you know, even if they responded within two days, you know, you're looking at July 9th. I obviously I can't get that to you a week before the hearing. Right. No, I that makes perfect sense. So, options are clear. Any discussion on the options this time? So the uh, option one, just so I understand, um, what we're asking for is the applicant to provide a written rebuttal within seven days. That's option two. That's, That's option, option two? Yeah. We don't want to do option one. Okay. No, okay. <laughs> the, the it's, one an option, it's an option you don't actually have. <laughs> Okay, so we're looking at number two, and then and then anybody can respond to the applicant's rebuttal seven days after that, and then we would have. Uh, and it, are, are we saying that the records open during that period? Is, Anyone is that, can submit written. Okay, and and then at what point does the record close after that second seven? After day period? that second seven day period, so on July sixth, the record would close to everyone except for the applicant. Okay. And during that last seven days, the applicant has that period to submit argument only. So there wouldn't be any evidence. There would just be argument, which, assumedly, you've already heard. All right. And and I see on um, on our um, uh, staff report the 120-day rule um, date is July 22nd. So. I could probably work with the applicant to get an extension of the 120. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask Ms. Crushar if she's amenable to that since she's here. Ah. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm clear about option two, and I like that. Very good. Like Should we make a motion? Option three, three done. if you keep it open, then you would have more oral. Or it's basically, it wouldn't be just for the rebuttal then. If option well, three. Or, is that correct? Correct. That, that because the, we would keep the hearing open. It would be a, and just a continuation. A, a continuation of what, okay. of what we have seen. So I, I guess I have one quick clarifying question. So the new, all the new information that's been submitted has been submitted uh, through for the neighborhood uh, association for the most part. For, correct. For now. What I'm what I'm getting at is for anybody that wants to take a look at that new information they only have a seven day window is, it, is that accurate or fairly you, accurate? you can make it longer if you would that's prefer. right that's right but uh, it, you can't it make it been, shorter okay and if it had been submitted uh, my only concern is you know for lay people as opposed to professional folks who can sit down and spend the time um, have enough time to look at the new information but I want to be comfortable with that that new information has been submitted from the folks that they that would have been doing that. that if you, if you wanted to do it, you could do 14 days, 14 days, and 14 days, or you could do it 14 days, 14 days, and seven days. The point is you have to have an opportunity for, rebut for written response, response to that response, and then the applicant gets the final word. Mm -hmm. I guess, That's would it be possible days. to bring the Neighborhood Association up to f make sure that they feel comfortable that that 21 days is? Or I guess that we're past that's, that point. It's we're past that point. So, uh, and I'm fine. Okay. so our decision is, do we go with option two or do we or go we with continue. option three and continue the, continuance. which is a full continuance and back to what we're just gone through. So, thoughts? I hear two for option two. Option two seems to make sense. And, and it makes sense to me with the only caveat that, that somebody out there ha want, wants that extra time to look at it. Looking at the room, having, you know, well, seeing what we've seen, I'm hoping and guessing there's not too many more of those. And, and if they are out there watching this, you got seven days, I well, guess. Well, I, I think, and I think seven days is reasonable. And I don't know that we're going to see a huge, That's right. you know, unless we get somebody send a 700 page document. <coughs> but who, who knows about that? <laughs> um, I have a question of the attorney. So, at the end, then, do we get um, verbal press, verbal rebuttal or information? It's all just written that goes to the planning commission, and that's would be the choice with either option two or three. 
Uh, well, the, th the, the third option the is The third option, if we go with a continuance, you would be able to come back and present oral rebuttal. But we may be having the same conversation but we may leaving be it having over for 21 days again. Okay. So it, it's, it sounds to me, if I'm speaking out of turn, please let me know, but it sounds to me like option two would be the appropriate option that everyone has been listening through. Actually, not right now. Thank you. I, Maybe I can ask clarifying questions because I think I know. Go ahead and ask. So why option one is where, off the table, whether we're or not we're able to decide up or down right. at this point. I just want to know why. And, I, and my Let's understanding say, is that's because new evidence has been submitted. submitted. I'll, 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 read, I'll read to you from. What is evidence? Uh, hold evidence? on. I can't take any, anything from the audience right now, please. Do you, the answer, do you want the answer please to the question? Please do. Evidence means facts documents, data, or other information offered to demonstrate compliance or non-compliance with the standards believed by the proponent to be relevant to the decision. Which we have received. So, it appears that we're going to move forward on option two. So what I will need is a, a, a motion to continue this no. hearing. Yes. To uh, would you uh, ask the attorney to put that into a motion or a uh, discuss a motion <laughs> with me? Because I would like to, we, we need to continue this hearing. This, this hearing will be continued okay. 14, 14. to allow a seven day period for the record to be op left open for the applicant to respond to the new evidence received today. That seven day period will expire at the close of business on the 29th. After that period, all parties will have until July 6th at the close of business to submit evidence and argument that is responsive to the documentation that the applicant submits. At that point on July 6th, the record will close to all parties except for the applicant at which point the applicant shall have seven days or until the close of business on July 13th to submit final written argument. On July 13th, the record will close to all parties and the Planning Commission will resume consideration of this matter on July 27th. So moved. So moved. Okay, we, we have a motion by Commissioner Stein. Commissioner Stein and a second, Commissioner Dunn. Uh, Tony, would you call the roll, please? What, um, Chair Paul? Oh, I'm sorry. Could I um, ask a question? Um, I'm a little concerned about the timing. Um, all of this response time, it really seems pretty short. And with the 4th of July, so is this, I'd ask. Is this sort of a typical amount of turnover time, or uh, the statute? The statute lays out seven, seven, seven. Um, I suppose you could make more. So my question is, if you make it fourteen, does it have to be fourteen, fourteen, fourteen? No, it can no. be four. It has to be fourteen, fourteen, and then the applicant can. It can be seven for the final argument if you want. But the two, for, the first two periods need to be the to be same good. amount because they're evidentiary. just want to make sure we do a, a good job and I'm a little concerned at just not having enough time because there's a lot of other activities going on sure well everyone's interested in mm -hmm. you doing your job and and it you know, wants to get all the if, you know, we want to get all the information mm -hmm. if we push it to the uh, 14 day will that go into August then or what yes what the, hear the hearing the hearing would um, so we'd be looking at um, what uh, seven six for July six for the f for the uh, applicant to respond, and then July twentieth, and then if you went a week for a final argument, it'd be the twenty seventh. If you go two weeks, it would be the third. And then the second Monday would be the 10th, and the fourth Monday would be the 24th. Of August, August 3rd? August 3rd would be the first Monday. 
So in effect, that will provide till the till the twenty seventh for the applicant. Is that correct? To to uh, take a look and and do their rebuttal. Well, if you did if you did six twenty three July June twenty third through July sixth, it'd be two weeks for the applicant. You do July seventh through July twentieth for um, evidence and response to what the applicant submitted. And then I guess it would depend on if the applicant wanted seven days or 14 days for their final response. If you did seven, you'd be uh, July 21 through July 27, and then we would mail it out on the 27th for the hearing on August um, August 10th. And for, uh, I guess, Mr. Chair, for discussion, it sounds like, although we I don't know if we can have that competition, but she might want a little that a little more time. Well, I'd like a little more, a uh, little time to actually look at it, uh, not get it on the same night that we're trying to make a decision. So, at this point, do we have to vote? Well, we, we got finish so discussion, vote the motion down, read, have another. Yeah, vote. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to withdraw my motion. I'll withdraw my second. Yeah. And withdraw the second. So the motion's been withdrawn and the second. So we're moving forward here with, with a new additional <laughs> days. 14, 14. 14. How, about, how about if we take five minutes? Let's do. And we will get all the dates down and give you your options. <laughs> That'd be great. Would that work for you, Commissioner? That'd be wonderful. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Because there's a lot of, a lot of, a dates, lot of flying dates flying around. around. <laughs> and I thought I got them all. Yeah, okay. <laughs>
Good, please. Okay, so I think we've worked out the dates. We're going to do 14, 14, 14. And then we have this, uh, the next planning commission hearing to listen to this master plan would be on August 10th, 2009. August 10th. So could you go over those dates for me, please? Sure. 622 of 09 through July 6th of 2009 will be the applicant responding. July 7th, 2009 through July 20th, 2009 will be um, evidence in response to what the applicant submitted. Okay, so we're not talking new evidence. We're talking in response to what the applicant submitted in response to the evidence tonight. And then the last 14 days, at this point, the only one who can respond is the applicant. And it would be from July 21st, 2009 through August 3rd, 2009, where the uh, applicant makes their final argument. At that point, on August 3rd, the record is closed, <coughs> and we will have a hearing on August 10th where you will make your decision. Um, at that point, you know, the staff and the attorney will be here to assist you, but um, unless you open it back up, that's what it's limited to. So okay. moved. Okay, we'll listen to that. We got a motion. We have a second. I'll second it. All right, Commissioner Groner motioned. Uh, Commissioner Dunn, that's second. Tony? Uh, Commissioner Stein? Aye. Commissioner Lejoie? Aye. Commissioner Dunn? Aye. Commissioner Groner? Aye. Chairperson Powell? Aye. Motion carries. All righty, very good. Thank you very much. Thank everyone for their involvement. Um, He will. It'll, everything, as Tony always does, an excellent job of <coughs> sending information out. So at this point, uh, do we have anything else for the commission? I think that will conclude it for tonight. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Tony. And right. Terry, thank you. And uh, at this time, uh, if there's nothing from the commission, then we will adjourn for this evening. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. All right. Thank you.